Romans 8, starting verse 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wondrous assurance your word gives us as it relates to our being um, in union with Christ, our being in your family. And I pray today, Lord, that um, any Christian brothers or sisters who are having a struggle with doubts or fears regarding their relationship with you, I pray that you would provide them a blessed assurance that comes from your presence by the work of your Holy Spirit. Certainly, if there are any in this room that don't know you, we, we pray the opposite. We pray they would feel no assurance, that you would strip any sort of false assurance they might be clinging to, that they might see that their only hope is to cling to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Pray you do that marvelous work in our hearts today, in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Well, last week, I spent some time establishing a theological distinction between security of salvation and assurance of salvation. As a quick reminder, security of salvation refers to the certainty with which God ultimately saves those whom he has effectually called unto himself. In other words, all those whom God justifies, God will glorify. Nothing can thwart God's purpose to bring to completion that which he has started, that which he has begun. On the basis of God's unalterable word, his unchangeable purpose, his steadfast promise, we can share in Paul's confidence regarding salvation as we hear in Philippians 1.6, I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, the reason why Paul could be confident about this is because he realized that salvation from beginning to end is God's work. Therefore, God's saving work is 100% secure because God is the one who keeps what he rescues. He holds on to his children. We persevere, yes, but because he preserves us. In order for there to be any assurance of salvation, this has to be our starting place. If you, can't, if you don't believe that God's the one who saves his people and holds on to them and keeps them to the end, then there can be no assurance within your heart that you will be ultimately saved. The only way we as fallible and stumbling men can have any hope of final redemption in our, is that our salvation itself rests in God's power alone to save and hold and complete, bringing us all the way to glory. You see, if anywhere along the line there, salvation hinged on me, I'm in trouble. And this is the point that's made when we talk about security of salvation. We're talking about God's ability, his power to complete what he has begun. Now, assurance of salvation is a reference to a believer's inward confidence that he or she is indeed one of God's children. So notice, security is a reference to God's ability to keep those whom he saved. Assurance is, refers to my inward confidence, whether I am one of those children or not. We know the Lord knows who are his, as from 2 Timothy, but Christians can still be susceptible to doubts and fears and worries and anxieties. Sometimes we might feel that God is distant, perhaps due to some of our own failings or difficulties or sins. It might also be the case that we carry with us um, a doubting disposition in general, which obscures our assurance of right standing with God. It's also possible that you've been a victim of false teaching. There are some who teach that you can never be sure that you're one of the Lord's children. Some even teach that uncertainty goes beyond the grave, that after you die, it still might be uncertain as to where you'll spend eternity. Take, for example, Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory. You know, they officially teach that you could land in purgatory, and a lot of people will land in purgatory according to their doctrine, and only by the prayers of the church and ministrations of the church, they might be able to pray you into heaven. So even your ultimate location might be dependent upon whether or not some people that you left behind are doing a good job praying you in out of purgatory and into heaven or going through indulgences or something of this nature. So notice that even there, 
Um, Rome is at least being consistent in, this, in, in, its, uh, <laughs> in its lack of assurance regarding salvation because you can go in and out of being one of God's children, go in and out of being in a state of grace even after you're dead. You see, those effectually called, believed, and sanct- are sanctified and persevere to the end is what the Bible teaches. They're given eternal life, never ending life. And God does not revoke his gifts or his callings. The sensible light, sight of the light and love of God may be for a time clouded and obscured, as we read in our um, confession of faith last time. Assurance may waver, but ultimately, those who are God's children are kept by the power of God unto salvation. So while Christians aren't meant to live in doubt, they can have moments in which they do doubt. And that doesn't at all affect God's ability to save his children. And yet, God does not intend for his children to live in a constant state of doubt about where they are in relationship with him. Last week, we saw how both the spirit of slavery and the spirit of adoption contribute to our assurance that we are God's children. We noted together that one of the worst problems for a lost world is that they're blind to their own condition. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit to to bring the truth to bear upon the human conscience and heart regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. See John 16, 8. So if if an unbeliever is brought to a sense of helplessness and hopelessness and feeling unworthy because he's been granted a real vision of God's greatness and goodness and holiness and power, that recognition is itself an expression of God's grace. At least this unbeliever isn't deceived about his own condition. Now, at that point, it doesn't necessarily mean they're saved yet. They can just really understand, I'm headed to hell, and I deserve it. Now, there are a whole host of unbelievers that aren't even there. They're just living life for themselves. They don't even care about what's to come, or they have some other thoughts about what's to come, or maybe just believe everyone goes to heaven. There is no recognition of their sin. There is no real recognition of God's holiness and and greatness and power. And so there's a lot of people self-deceived about where they are. But if an unbeliever is brought to at least this point, if they're brought to a point where they're aware of their spiritual bankruptcy before God, apart from being in Christ, There is a blessing in that. As much as that's a horrific place to be living in, as much as that will torture the the human soul contemplating that reality, it's actually a blessing from the Lord that they realize their real state before a holy God. And I think this is a little bit of the reference that we're talking about, about the spirit of slavery leading to fear. Someone who's brought to that brink have have realized the, the nature of their sin before a holy God. Yet as wondrous as an aware position is, It's nothing compared to the true position that Christians have been given. The point that's being made in in, uh, verse 15 is that we have not received a spirit of slavery again unto fear, but instead a spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So not only have we been brought low by the Holy Spirit, recognizing our spiritual bankruptcy, but now we've received a spirit of adoption whereby we can cry out, Abba, Father. Not only are we no longer enslaved to sin and therefore no longer under a fearful expectation of coming judgment, but we have been forgiven and rescued and redeemed. We've been brought into God's family through Christ. We've been adopted. We've been made children of God, made sons of the Lord. We call out to God as our daddy, as our father. We've gone from slavery to sin, an expectation of judgment, to liberty in the Holy Spirit and the promise of undeserved blessings. We went from deserved judgment to undeserved blessing. The Holy Spirit has awakened our souls to our lostness and then granted us repentance and faith from which we turned from our sin and from the world and turned unto Christ. But that's not all. Because Romans 8, 16, and 17 provides us with further grounds for assurance. So in a continuation from last week, I'd like to just entitle this Assurance Part 2, so we can be further encouraged in God's wondrous work of not only saving us, but assuring us of that salvation. This is what's so glorious, right? I mean, does God really have to assure us again and again? He doesn't have to, and yet because he's so gracious and loving and he knows our frame, he does so. So let's consider two more things, two further realities which ought to bring comfort to a believer's heart. And if you're an unbeliever, you should realize you lack these things and therefore you ought to run to Christ and be saved that you might enjoy sonship. 
First of all, let's look at the confirmation of the Spirit seen in verse 16, the confirmation of the Spirit. I want to see two things here about how the Spirit is uh, spoken of here. The first is I want to talk about the independent witness of the Holy Spirit, the independent witness of the Holy Spirit. We've already noted the word pneuma in, in Greek here, translated spirit in this passage several times. This word happens around 20 times in Romans 8, 20 times, while only happening five times in the seven chapters leading up to Romans 8. That word pneuma comes up five times before Romans 8. We get to Romans 8, we get 20 occurrences of the word, and then after Romans 8, we have a handful more of them going to the end of the book. Romans 8 is definitely concerned with the role of the Holy Spirit in the work of redemption. I want to take a quick look at the earlier occurrences. occurrences. I told you it happened. the word pneuma happens five times before we get to Romans 8. If you want to flip back with me, I'm just going to, I want you to read these passages real quick, make a couple of comments on each, and then we'll come back to where we are. Go to Romans 1.4. First occurrence of pneuma says, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Easy to pick out the Holy Spirit there, right? <laughs> referred to as the spirit of what? Holiness. Here we see the Holy Spirit referred to as the spirit of holiness, a very fitting title attached to the spirit of God. By the way, the spirit of God is gives many titles throughout scripture. It'd be an interesting study to do, just looking at all the different titles the Holy Spirit has given throughout the scriptures. But here he said at the very beginning, he's referred to as the spirit of holiness, a very fitting title concerning the theme of righteousness that flows through the book of Romans. He's called the spirit of holiness. Go down to verse 9 of chapter 1. For God whom I serve in my spirit. There's the word spirit again, but note here we recognize that this is a different reference. This is no longer a reference to the Holy Spirit here, but to Paul's own spirit. Paul says, for God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. It's important to note here my spirit, Paul referring to his own spirit, which you'll also do in verse 16, as we'll see in just a moment. Go to Romans 2.29. Romans 2.29. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Here, Paul's explaining that the identification of God's people is not grounded in external or outward acts, but in, 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 uh, instead in inward realities. This distinctive mark of God's people is not outward circumcision, but a circumcision of the heart. The, 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 uh, the distinguishing mark of God's people is spiritual in nature, not physical. Go to Romans 5.5. 5. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. If you back up in chapter 5 up to verse 1, we notice in this whole passage is a discussion of what's been given to us as a result of justification by faith alone through grace alone, uh, by, by grace alone through faith alone, and that is that we've been given peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, an introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand, and as a result of all of that, we exult in tribulations because we have a hope that doesn't disappoint. Why? Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. And then jump over to Romans 7, verse 6. For now, but now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. I believe that verse 6 is a crucial verse here in Romans 7 and 8 because I think it sets up the contrast between what is it like to live in the newness of the Spirit, or another way of saying that is in the new way of the Spirit rather than in the old way of the letter, of the law. And what I think we have in the rest of chapter 7 is a person attempting to live by the old way of the law. And what you find is just complete inability to do so. Com continued struggle within his own mind. I want to do things that I can't do, and I'm not doing the things I'm supposed to do. And finally, throwing up his hands, oh, wretched man. <laughs> I'm a wretched man. I can't do it. 
I think what we have going on in Romans 7 is kind of a, uh, a depiction of that oldness of the letter. This is what it looks like to try to live by the law. You will fail. But meanwhile, the description of the new way of the Spirit, I think, is what's described very well in Romans 8. Romans 8 is describing the Spirit and how life in the Spirit looks, what, it, what it's all about, how it's motivated, what goes on here. You see, we've died to the law. We've been released from its dominion. We're no longer a slave to sin. And we now serve in the new way of the Spirit under his direction and lead. And I think that's what Romans 8 is all about. We've been kind of given several breadcrumbs along the way throughout Romans, little indications about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. But it's here in Romans 8 that we get a much more detailed explanation about the Spirit's work in redemption. And verse 16 is emphatic in using the word pneuma in two distinct ways. The word happens twice here. Let me sit back here. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Note here, two distinct spirits. First of all, there is the Spirit himself. Now, here's an unfortunate translation. If you have actually the old King James, um, you'll see that the pronoun that's translated here is itself rather than himself. The old King James says, the spirit itself testifies with our spirit. Whereas all of our other translations here translate, rightly, the word himself. Now probably the reason why uh, King James, old King James did it this way is because the pronoun in Greek is actually neuter in gender. But the reason why it's neuter is because pronouns have to agree with the antecedents in gender. And the word spirit, pneuma in Greek, is a neuter word. So if you're going to refer to spirit in Greek with a pronoun, you're going to use auta rather than autas. Why? Because it's neuter in gender. The gender of the pronoun has to match the antecedent that it's, it's referencing. And so here, it's the word auta, which would technically be usually translated itself, but because of what we know about the spirit, that the spirit is not an impersonal force, he's not an emotion or merely an expression, but a person who is truly God, just as father is God and son is is God. Therefore, the proper way to translate this pronoun is with the word himself. In defense of that statement, let me give you just a couple sample scriptures. We could do this on another occasion in full, fuller detail, but I want to just give a couple of defenses to why I can say that this should be trans translated himself rather than itself. The Holy Spirit is listed alongside the Father and Son in passages like 2 Corinthians 13, 14, a, a famous kind of benediction that often, sometimes we even have listed here behind us at the end of our services. I also think of Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all listed listed there side by side. We know the Holy Spirit is involved in creation in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We read in Job 33, 4 that the Holy Spirit gives life. We know the Holy Spirit inspired scripture. See 2 Peter 1, 21. The Holy Spirit sent out mission, uh, ministers and missionaries. Acts 13, 2 through 4. Acts 20, verse 28. We know the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. See John 16, I already referenced that earlier. Uh, the Holy Spirit guides. Uh, John 16, 13. The Holy Spirit teaches. John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit sanctifies. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Also, the Holy Spirit is described as being able to be grieved in Ephesians 4.30, resisted in Acts 7.51, undervalued in Acts 8.19-20, insulted in Hebrews 10.29, and blasphemed in Matthew uh, 12.31 and 32. See, all of these uh, references, this is just a smattering, and you go much further than that, to establish the fact that the Holy Spirit is not just some impersonal it, but a person of the Godhead, so we should translate the, ver the pronoun here, himself, as all of our modern translations, even the New King James has translated it. And then we have not only the spirit himself, but then there is our spirit. The Greek construction here is the spirit of us, or our spirit. So Paul is referring to the testimony of the Holy Spirit as an independent thing to our spirit's testimony, such that he can say ultimately that the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit. In other words, for him to jointly testify with our spirit, he must be making his own testimony. 
There must be an independent testimony, an independent witness that's happening from the Holy Spirit. In other words, verse 16 is not merely saying, this is an important point, this is not merely saying that the Holy Spirit is the one who enables us, look at the, the previous verse, to have the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Some people have, have translated verse 16 as just an explanation of verse 15, saying that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. All it's doing there is it's, this is the means by which we cry out to our Father and say, Abba, or Daddy. There are some who end up describing the testimony of the Spirit as merely a, a recapitulation of what's already been said. They argue that this testimony is seen in things like the fruit of the Spirit and, or uh, the believer's change of life as a result of sanctification, uh, a believer's commitment to truth, uh, a believer's longing to pray, a believer's selfless service or love for God and others, all the blessings that come to us by the Holy Spirit. There are some that argue that all this is saying is just another way of saying what we've already said. And while I in no way, shape, or form want to disregard all of those things, genuine production of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. I, I point you back up to verse 14. All those being led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. I do believe that there's actual fruit and production that comes from a believer's life as a result of the Holy Spirit leading and directing them. While I grant all of that, I believe that this verse, verse 16, is saying something further. It's not just recapitulating what's already been said. It says here that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, I can't exactly put into words the content and form of this testimony, but I believe I can at least make a few statements about it. First of all, it's a distinctive testimony. Why can I say that? Because it is distinguished from our own spirit's testimony. Again, I don't think this is just saying this is the means by which we cry out, Abba, Father. We're being told here that the Spirit himself is testifying with our spirit. What is our spirit saying? Our spirit is saying, Abba, Father. We're crying out to him, yes, by the motivation of the Holy Spirit. But now we're being given something more here. The Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. So I think, first of all, it's a distinctive testimony. The second thing I would say is I believe that this is a gift given to all believers. I do not get the impression that the Spirit's testimony here is somehow reserved for only certain believers or that a second experience is necessary in order to come to enjoy this. Now, there are several teachers and commentators, even, I will say, some that are not from charismatic circles, who will claim that this testimony made by the Spirit is one that not all sons of God receive. Some would attach this testimony of the Spirit some would go even further to say even the adoption that's described in verse 15 is all part of a second blessing or some sort of baptism of the Spirit. And when they say that phrase, they mean in distinction from your conversion experience. They're saying that this baptism of the Spirit something happens later or in some other experience, almost like a second sort of conversion or a second step in the way towards conversion, depending on how they describe that. Others would connect it in connection with something like you know, some sort of experience that a Christian has, like going to a revival or having some sort of revival experience or some sort of overwhelming experience of the Spirit of God whereby a believer's lingering doubts are obliterated. So the idea here is if you've received this, you don't doubt your salvation ever again. If you've received this experience, it's confirming in such a way that it obliterates any doubt or hesitation that would ever be in your mind ever again. Now, I want to say there are different motivations behind why someone might teach that. There are a couple, of, there's, there's a lot of different explanations that can be given. I'm going to give two. And if I leave out one that you think I should have, we can talk about it later. But I'm going to, I want to mention at least these two. Some teach this way, that there's some sort of second experience or baptism of the Spirit or some sort of, you know, authenticating thing that happens later on that then like dispels all doubt. Some teach this way because they just believe it's the pattern found in the early church. The, the disciples and many others who followed Christ were, in one sense, already Jesus' disciples. And yet it wasn't until later that they received the Spirit, um, often also accompanied with speaking in tongues and things of this nature, a miraculous phenomenon. But they would later receive the Spirit, and we're told after having received the Spirit, they went out with great power and conviction, even willing to lay down their lives for the sake of the gospel. There are others who might, 
argue that way and might add this to that or there are others that might just say this instead of that and that, that's this. Some are just wanting to try to make, maintain the distinction that I've already been making these past couple of weeks to distinguish between security of salvation and assurance. Some believe this is why there can be Christians who are genuinely saved and yet have doubts. It's not that their salvation is in jeopardy, just that they haven't experienced the spirit of adoption or this testimony of the Holy Spirit yet. So in other words, you're just immature in the faith. You're just coming along. And the reason why you have doubts and worries and anxieties is just because you haven't had this experience yet. Now, we can always talk about the motivations that, that come from behind this, but ultimately it's hard for us to delve into those, right? It's, it's hard to know what's going on in, a, in other humans' heart. The, the Lord and the Spirit searches the heart. He knows what's there. It's hard for us to know. Is it possible for some of these people to doing, be doing this for like selfish gain or from charlatan reasons? Yes. Is it also possible that some do it from genuine reasons? I believe so. I believe so. I want to quickly give my response to both of those two points and expose where I think there's some error in how they're going about this. First of all, the early church experienced a very unique situation. Rem remember with me what was going on in the early church when Jesus walks on the earth. We have old covenant believers. They're under the old covenant who are now witnesses to the arrival of the life, the teaching, the death, and the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, meaning the Messiah. The Messiah is here. They were rightly related to God as far as could be said in the old covenant sense. But now that, the, that God's son has come and completed his work, the gospel has now been delivered. They must believe in Christ. There could be no remain, remaining in the place of waiting for the Messiah because the Messiah had come. They have to believe. And in so doing, the Holy Spirit was given to them alongside accompanying miraculous signs to authenticate the further act of God in redemptive history. And this happened, as you see, and you read in the book of Acts, not only to the Jews, but also we see a group of Samaritans, and then we see some Gentiles as well. And we see in Jerusalem Council and stuff like this, when they're discussing what's going on with God's plan for the nations, they go, well, the Lord confirmed through them the same things that happened with us. And he uses this to bolster confidence that this work of the gospel was meant for the nations. I think what Acts does is it provides us with a very honest recording of those events. But Acts shouldn't be read necessarily as an indication to then tell us that we should all go through some sort of two-step process of salvation and thereby, thereby normalize that process. Nor do we get the indication from Acts or anywhere else in the Bible that we should expect miraculous signs to be present. Wherever you stand on the idea of miracles, the reason why they were miracles is because they weren't normal everyday occurrences. They were unusual inbreakings. If you look throughout redemptive history, you see that, that there's a lot of miracles at very particular times spaced out with not much mir miraculous activity. Again, you also have to get into def definitions of miracles and how you define that, again, for another time. But I just want to at least indicate this, is that to indicate that the reason why there must be a second blessing or a second baptism or a second experience, because that's what happened in Acts, I think is not a helpful way of going about that. The, the believers in the book of Acts are experiencing a, a very new thing in redemptive history. Secondly, for those who say, well, this is just helpful towards distinguishing between assurance and certainty, that you can have Christians who, you know, struggle with doubts and anxieties about where they are in the Lord. And then meanwhile, you have these other people that are really sure. And the, the difference is that they've had this second blessing or second experience. Um, I, I first want to, again, affirm that I believe that Christians can be saved and that Christians can enjoy varying levels of assurance, which in no way lessens God's, abs God's absolute unwavering commitment to save all those whom he has justified. But this does not set up some necessity for separating out the adopting, sealing, testifying ministry of the Holy Spirit into some sort of totally different experience that can be had or not had. The text before us, I mean, and I've read through this multiple times this week, trying my best to see this argument because some people I highly respect even hold this view, even, even themselves not being charismatics, hold a second kind of experience view here. And I've done my best to try to really pour over this text. Like, do I see any indication in this text that we're talking about different groups of people along the way? Every time I read through it, I just don't see it. There's no indicators here that there's different groups being spoken to here. Back up with me. Just read it with me and just see how this reads. 
Go back to, let's go, you can start anywhere here. Let's start in verse, uh, start in verse 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he does not belong to him. So that's clear, right? Those who have the Spirit are Christians. Those who do not are not. Verse 10, if, the, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So again, same point being made, all believers who have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God rose Jesus from the dead, he'll raise us from the dead as well. We've been given new life. Verse 12, so then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Again, emphatically, all those led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. I, I don't see any point in this text where all of a sudden it's like, oh, by the way, side note, some of you are going to struggle with this because you haven't been given this second blessing. It doesn't read that way. Instead, what we have is things that are applicable to all believers just as the previous verses were. As a matter of fact, what it does for me is I go, if you, if you make this distinction here, well, then why wouldn't you back up to verse 14 and also say there's some people not led by the Spirit that are also still Christians? But you see, the verse doesn't allow for that, so you can't say that. And so then you get down here and you start, like, for some reason, trying to make a distinction where I just don't see that there is one. So I have to explain this a little bit further. Here's the third thing I think we can say about this. So what I'm, what I'm saying, <laughs> summarize all that. What was I trying to say that? This is a gift given to all believers. All believers have this. That's the point I'm making. Okay, third. It's a testimony that can be enjoyed to varying degrees. So this is where I'm going to make my distinction. And as I just explained above, I believe that the testimony of the Spirit is for all believers, but I do not believe that this is something that cancels all doubts that might arise in a believer's soul. Here, here's at least one reason why I say that. If that was the case, then why is the Bible full of promises to reassure believers? Why include those? Like, why ever talk to believers and say, hey, I know you might feel down here, but like, take heart. Lord Jesus, overcome the world. Like, like hang in there. Don't grow weary in doing good. In due season, you'll reap. You don't lose heart. Like, like why statements like that if you never would struggle why would all these precious promises be required if the Spirit's testimony settled any and all doubts for all time? Again, maybe those of the other persuasion would say, well, that's just because that's for the immature Christians. <laughs> the mature ones have had the second blessing. They never doubt it again. They're just, you know, flying high from there on. Maybe that's the way they would respond. Again, I just don't see that. In other words, I believe you can have this gift, the testimony of the Holy Spirit, and still have moments of doubt and struggle. I don't think that the promise of this gift means that you, as a Christian, will never have moments of doubt. As a matter of fact, I think the reason why this is a gift from the Spirit is because he's counteracting those doubts. He's acting in such a way to help us in moments where we feel those doubts arising. Fourth thing I could say, I think, about this is that it is a testimony that is different than the evidence we've already mentioned. This is a testimony that is different than the evidence we've already mentioned. In some of my previous sermons, we've talked about things like the fruit of the Spirit. We've talked about things like sensitivity to sin. We've talked about things like desire for holiness. These are, these are important. Why? Because, number one, for an unbeliever, it's a good thing to check. Like, do I have absolutely, like, is my conscience seared and I don't even care about sin? I'd be like, I don't think you're a Christian. <laughs> like, like that, that's not possible. Like, a Christian feels the weight of sin, like feels guilty about sin, like wants to pursue holiness. So that kind of element. And if you feel that inside of you and you see the fruit of the Spirit going on in your life, then, oh, those are good evidences that you are a Christian. It's fruit of the Spirit, production of the Spirit. Those things are all helpful and good. But I don't think that's what verse 16 is talking about. 
Again, all those spiritual signs of life are helpful and appropriate to consider when doubts arise. It can be good to um, exercise or take stock of your spiritual condition. Is there evidence of God's work upon my heart? Have I grown in likeness to Christ? Do I care about lost people? Do I hunger and thirst for righteousness? Do I love the church? Do I long to serve the Lord? Am I growing in generosity? Do I want to be with God's people? Those are all good tests to ask yourself. All still very, very valid. Because I think those are all evidences of being led by the Spirit of God. But this testimony is the Holy Spirit's testimony, what? That we are children of God. And while we ought to be careful when spiritual life is made into something purely subjective, because certainly the Bible does not do that, I think it would also be an error to say there is no subjective element of our life with the Lord. A person who places all of their confidence in feelings and subjective inward impulses is in an extremely dangerous place. If all you think religion is, relationship with God, is just ooey-gooey feelings, and when they're there, you feel great, and when they're not, you're, you're in a horrible place, it's not a good place to live. We're not called to live in that sort of arena. But this does not mean that there are no inward subjective feelings. The, the, the Bible is full of um, logical argument and rational organization and, like, you know, conforming our minds and transforming us through study of the word and all of that. But it also impacts the heart. It, it also impacts us inwardly, inward impulses. All that, that is a real thing still. Schreiner says it this way. Ultimately, the text describes a religious experience that is ineffable. For the witness of the Holy Spirit with the human spirit, that one is a child of God, is mystical in the best sense of the word. Nor is that word mystical, we kind of get a little, hmm. But he's like, in the best sense of this word, it's something that kind of goes beyond rationality. Not irrational, but beyond rationality. Some veer away from this idea because of its subjectivity, but the abuse of the subjective in some circles cannot exclude the mystical and emotional dimensions of Christian experience. I agree with Schreiner there. Just because there are horrible abuses that run around these lines does not mean then that we just shut off our emotions and shut off how we feel inwardly because there's people who go to excesses. No. This testimony is an inward knowing that you are one of God's children. It is an inward assurance that you've been adopted into God's family that you're resting in Christ's righteousness. You're, you feel an inward gratitude that you're one of God's sons. And yeah, you can go through all those rational things. There's a part of that. But I think this is talking about something else. I think it's talking about that subjective state where there's just this like knowing, this resting in my father's care. I'm his. And it, and it goes beyond even sometimes my outward circumstances. Outward circumstances look like God doesn't like me, but I know he loves me. And I know that, yes, through some, some facts and figures, some things the scripture has pointed out, but there's also an inward testimony of the Holy Spirit that reassures me that I'm his. Robert Haldane says it this way, this is a testimony that is designed for the sanctification of believers themselves and cannot be submitted to the scrutiny of others. He says, this is not something that anyone else could test for you. I, I can't look at Pastor Michael and go, oh, yeah, you know, the Spirit is testifying with your spirit. Like, I, I, I can't do that. It's an inward thing. It's something between the Holy Spirit and the believer's spirit. This testimony, although it, cannot, uh, although it cannot be explained, is nevertheless felt by the believer. It is felt by him, too, in its variations. Listen to this. I agree with Haldane here. This is the way to understand this. Sometimes stronger and more palpable, other times more feeble and less discernible. In other words, this is not a promise that you'll never have a doubt again in your life. And I honestly think that kind of teaching can be damaging to people. Because then they're like, let's say that you even had your second experience. You had your baptism of the Spirit, whatever you want to describe that as. And then later on, you have some doubt. Now what are you left with? Like, I've had a third experience, and a fourth experience, and a fifth experience, and a 180th experience. And I think there are some people there. Seriously, they're caught in this cycle of like, I've got to find another thing that will dispel all doubt. Because I think they're thinking about this the wrong way. There will be times in which this, this, this inward sense will feel stronger. And there will be times in which this inward sense doesn't feel as strong. It's a part of how the Lord is providing us with affirmation. But it's not the totality of how he's providing us with affirmation. 
Notice what's more here. Look at the second thing about this. Everything else will go a little quicker this morning. The corroborating witness of the Holy Spirit. Notice it's an independent witness because it's a distinctive witness, but it's corroborating because it's with our spirit. Note here, they are tied together. Verse 16, the spirit himself testifies with. That word there, testifies with, is actually one word in, in Greek. It starts with the with. The soon is before it. So there, it's a testimony with our spirit that we are children of God. This, this verse reminds us of things like Deuteronomy 17.6 or 19.15 where there's an establishment of how do you establish truth on a matter. You need two or three witnesses to determine guilt. A matter had to be confirmed by two or three. We still find such procedures in courts of law. Establishing truth is largely built upon testimonies made by different people that validate one another. Right? It's one thing to have an eyewitness testimony. It's another to have two eyewitness testimonies and they fit together. They're saying the same stuff. Even more if you have three. Normal police procedure involves checking a suspect's alibi. If a person is somewhere else at the time of a crime, as verified by the testimony of someone else, he might be excluded entirely from being a suspect. Paul's point here, Christians are provided with two inward spiritual testimonies. And what are those two inward spiritual testimonies? Our own spirit with the Holy Spirit. Two testimonies inwardly corroborating one another. Sinclair Ferguson said, we can make two mistakes here. We can expect a mystical transporting experience or we can expect nothing. Both are wrong. I like that. I think some people read this too and they're looking again for some spiritual out-of-body experience. It's not what's being spoken of here. But it's also not speaking about nothing. <laughs> it's speaking about something. You'd be wrong to go excesses in either direction. Assurance can be dramatic or calm, but either way, it is the joint witness of God's Spirit with our spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies together with our spirit. There's an inward harmony. God's Spirit, the Spirit of holiness, the Spirit of truth, the Comforter, is testifying with our innermost being that we are God's children. I love the way that Lloyd-Jones said it. He says, we have the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. This is the child's cry of love to his father, right? That's what verse 15 is talking about. Our cry of love to our father because the Holy Spirit has regenerated, has given us new life by which we cry out to our father, Abba. We cry out to dad, our daddy. We, we tell him we love him. That, that's, that's coming from us. But here it is, as he goes on, through the spirit God telling us he loves us and doing so in a most unmistakable manner. It is personal, it is secret, it is within the soul. What, what thanksgiving ought to overflow from our hearts? God's love and care extends even to the place where we would experience this inward confirming testimony of the Holy Spirit with our spirit that we are his. Moo expresses this wonder well when he said, the Holy Spirit is not only instrumental in making us God's children, he also makes us aware that we are God's children. You see that? The Holy Spirit not only makes us God's children, but makes us sure that we're aware that we are his children. Why? By an inward testimony with our spirit that we are his children. He saves us and makes us aware of the transaction. The Holy Spirit's testimony provides us with assurance. Which leads us to another point of assurance. Here's point two, the guarantee of inheritance. And we see this in the first part of verse 17, the guarantee of inheritance. First of all, note we are heirs. Verse 17 follows very naturally from the previous verses. When it comes to inheritances, it is most often the case that it is the children of the parents who receive the lion's share of the goods. There might be exceptions to this. Somebody might write into their will somebody else or something else. But often it is the case, the next of kin, children, are the inheritors of their parents' goods, estate. In Jewish tradition, the firstborn son would usually receive a double portion of the estate. But the point being made here is not so much on the amount as to the sheer fact of being an heir. All those who are children of God are heirs. 
It's interesting to see the way that Paul explains this reality in Galatians 3. Because in Galatians 3, he talks about promises that were made to Abraham and to his seed. And he makes a big point about this, that this is singular, not plural. He does not say to seeds, but to one, to your seed. And then Paul goes on to explain to us, that is Christ. The promise ultimately was to Jesus. And then you go a little bit further in Galatians 3 to verse 29. He says, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants. So get this. The promise was ultimately to Abraham's seed, that is Jesus. But because we who are Christians are in Christ, that now makes us Abraham's seed as well. And therefore, he says, heirs according to promise. The promise made to Abraham fulfilled in Christ, but given to us because we who are Christians are in Christ. And then you go to Galatians 4, 7. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. As heirs, we recognize this. I love it when he describes us as heirs. What does an heir recognize? Well, an heir recognizes that there are blessings yet to come, right? An inheritance is something that you wait for. Unless you're the prodigal son and demands it now, right? And gets into all that trouble. But normally the way this works, you wait until your parents have died, passed away. At that point, the inheritance comes. Reminding ourselves that we're heirs reminds us that the, the Lord's promises to us as his people, the fulfillment of those promises lie mainly in the future. We're not looking for our best life now. We're looking for our best life to come. It's not that there are no promises or blessings in the present, just that our focus must always be on eternity. We live in the present with our gaze ever fixed on the new heavens and new earth. When writing to the Colossians, Paul thanks God the Father who, quote, has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. Colossians 1.12. When Jesus tells about God's judgment on sheep and goats, he explains when this inheritance was ordained. He tells them when the sheep had their inheritance ordained to be given to them. In Matthew 25, 34, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. From the foundation of the world. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, Momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comprehension, uh, comparison. While we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. Not at things which are seen, uh, are, because the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So note here, first of all, we are heirs. Second of all, we are heirs of God. It's one thing to be an heir. This usually means the stewardship of property or inheritance of goods will eventually come to you. But it's a further thing to be the heir of a wealthy or powerful family or house. This means a greater stewardship to be entrusted to you, a greater amount of goods to be given. In the case of Christians, what are we? We are heirs of God. There is no one more powerful, no one more rich, no one more generous, no one more wise, no one more loving than God. And while human inheritances can amount to little to nothing, God's resources are limitless. His kingdom is forever. And while human wills can change, Benefactors can be switched, stricken from wind will, <laughs> someone else replacing that spot. God's will remains settled. God completes all his good purpose. He never lies. Remember, this inheritance set from before the foundation of the world. Now, I will mention that there are a couple of ways to take this phrase of God. It's genitive case. It could communicate source. What it means is that we are the inheritors of God's goods, his a stewardship from him, resources from him, gifts from him, blessings from him. In other words, Christians receive the blessings that come from God. We are inheritors of God's things. God has blessed us with his stuff. It could also be read to understand the content or the nature of the inheritance. You could say instead that the heirs who inherit God. God being the one we get. God being the inheritance that believers receive. The supreme benefit of the covenant with God is not the blessings he bestows, but God himself. Now, I don't think we have to, you know, this is the beauty of this. I don't think we have to draw a hard and fast line there, do we? 
Inheriting God's kingdom will involve all the bountiful blessings he wishes to bestow, but the greatest blessing of all is God himself. God is the portion of his people, and therefore in him who created, sustains, and possesses all things, we are heirs of all things. Psalm 73, 25, Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you I desire nothing on earth. This is the heart's cry of a Christian, desire to be with the Lord in his presence, under his rule, in his blessing. Quickly turn over Revelation 21 with me. We'll just look at the first seven verses here. Revelation 21, starting in verse 1. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Do you see it? Do we have to pick between the two? Nope. All those who are God's heirs inherit God himself. God himself will be among us. We shall be his people. We shall be his sons. He is our God. And yet it is also said here that we will inherit all of these things. The spring of water of life without cost. Lastly, note with me that we are co-heirs with Jesus. Co-heirs with Jesus. He's back over again in Romans 8. For if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. This last phrase reminds us about the basis upon which we are heirs of God. The reason we have right relationship with God is that we are, and that we are guaranteed a place forever with him, enjoying his reign, enjoying his rule, basking in his presence, serving him forever and ever, is because we are in Christ. Again, we see how union with Christ is central and crucial to everything. Moose said it this way, We, the sons of God, are, are such by virtue of our belonging to the Son of God. And we are heirs of God only by virtue of our union with He, uh, with the one who is the heir of all of God's promises. Note again, that's what Galatians was saying, right? Jesus is the heir of the promises. We are heir of the promises because we are in Christ. He is the son of God by which we become sons of God. He is the heir of God by which we become the heirs of God. Hebrews 1, 2, in the last days he spoke to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. It's through union with Christ that we share in the inheritance that he gained for himself and for all those whom he redeems. We had read earlier in Hebrews 9, Dominic read this for us, this is in verse 15, for this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. It is by the nature of our union with Christ that we become heirs of God. We are therefore joint heirs with Christ in being heirs of God. I want to close by reading one other passage with you. Turn over to 1 Peter 1. Peter also speaks of the glorious inheritance which we have in Jesus Christ. 
But you'll also note that there is mention of struggle and hardship in this life. And next week together, you're going to see where this goes in Romans 8. I stopped right before it, right? Look at the next phrase there. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. It's interesting that when the idea of inheritance comes up, we think of ideas of glory, but there's also the theme of suffering. We have to keep our eyes fixed on the prize before us because in this fallen world, things won't be easy. But take heart. Jesus Christ has overcome the world. And by God's grace, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are joint heirs with him. So hold on to this precious truth. Be assured of where you are in relationship with the Lord. Know that you're a son of the Lord. Know that you're a child of God. Know that you're an inheritor of all the promises in Christ. And then with all that in mind, take up courage. Take up strength for the difficulties that we, we meet with in this life. Look at this in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain, here it is, an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Dear friends, remember this. Keep your eyes fixed on this. An inheritance which cannot be taken away, which is undefiled, imperishable, will not fade, reserved for you by God who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Here it is. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the glorious truth that you not only save us, but assure our hearts that we're yours. Lord, we're sorry for the way in which our, our feeble hearts and minds can, can doubt and, and fear and experience anxiety and worry when we know that you are our sovereign, our God, our Lord, our Savior. Thank you for dealing with us so tenderly. Thank you for caring for us so well. Thank you for super adding your promises and not only giving us promises and external fruits and all of that that we can consider, but thank you for the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit, testifying with our spirits that we're your children. Thank you for the assurance you provide. Thank you for the inheritance you have promised that is ours because we're in Christ. Help us to keep our eyes focused upon you and to live in light of these glorious promises. Lord, help us to tell others too about the truth of the good news of Christ, that they can be rescued out of darkness and brought into your marvelous light, be called sons of yours. Lord, prepare us for difficult days. Some of us might right now be in the midst of trying circumstances, things that threaten to feel like they overwhelm us. We pray that you would preserve us, care for us, help us. Give us the fortitude and strength to persevere. And Lord, may even that suffering be utilized to rebound your glory. Lord, we thank you for this church family, the support that it provides us with. I pray that you would strengthen us for the days ahead and that you'd be honored in Jesus' name. Amen.